Some of our viewers know that I am an avid Gwent fan, and they've asked me, what is Gwent, why should I care, and how do I get started? Gwent is a card game in the Witcher universe. No surprises there. The appeal of Gwent is gaining more control over your deck as the match continues in order to outpredict and outplay your opponent. In this way, Gwent is a game about foresight and prediction. To play Gwent, both players put down cards that are worth a certain number of points until both players pass or both players run out of cards. Whoever has the highest score when this happens wins the round. The winner of the game is whoever wins two out of three rounds. The complexity of Gwent comes from determining which resources should be used in which order on which round. In order to defeat most opponents, many players will need to successfully analyze and decide what their opponent's strategy is and how best to defeat it with the tools that they have at their disposal. The way that cards are drawn in Gwent enables this game of foresight and prediction with your opponent. In round 1, both players are given 10 cards and 2 redraws in a 25 card deck, giving about a 50% chance that any single card will be drawn. However, since the game gives 3 draws and 2 redraws in every subsequent round, this this means 22 cards will either be drawn or redrawn in a 25 card deck. This gives players a lot of control over which cards end up in their round 3 hands, with some decks going far enough to discard cards that they don't like to give complete control over what cards end up in their round 3 hands. If a player passes in a round, they get to keep all the cards that they saved from the previous round into the next round, providing that they don't go past the maximum hand size of 10. This means that each player is encouraged to play at least 3 cards per round in order to make sure that they don't hit the maximum hand size in the next round. If a player wins round 1, they don't need to win round 2, but their opponent does. This means that their opponent may need to spend extra cards, which means that they won't have those cards in round 3. In addition, whoever wins round 1 gains the ability to play the last card of the game, which is a boon in and of itself, since that means that the opponent cannot mess with at least one of your cards. With all of the advantages gained from winning round 1, you might be tempted to play all of your best cards in round 1 and use your leader's ability. Your leader's ability is basically an 11th card that you get to play at any time alongside one of your other cards. As round 1 drags on, the opponent's pattern should emerge and this should reveal how they plan on winning the game. After you determine your opponent's strategy, you can take whatever actions necessary to minimize the effectiveness of their strategy or maximize the effectiveness of yours. So if you determine that your opponent's deck will win in a long round, you might want to dedicate yourself to winning round 1 so that way you can push in round 2, so that way even if your opponent does win and you potentially go a card down, you at least go into the final round with you and your opponent having a maximum of 4 cards which may be advantageous if their deck requires a lot of setup or has cards that get stronger over time. I would even go so far as to say that the skills that lead the victory most in Gwent are the ability to figure out what your opponent is using, the ability to decide what are the right cards to use in the right round, and the ability to pass at the right time to cause your opponent to commit too many resources in the wrong round. However, since round 3 is the most important of all rounds, it begs the question what are you willing to put down in round 1 to get all the advantages in round 3. This can lead to situations early on where both players are taking as much time as possible to try and predict every single card that the opponent is willing to play and how far they're willing to go in response. Gwent gets its greatest appeal from this mastermind feeling of predicting predictions and predicting what your opponent's going to do. At the end of the game, you sometimes feel like you've literally predicted every single card that they've played from the first turn. This is enough to summarize the core concepts behind every game of Gwent, now we need to get into the specifics. I intentionally ignored some of the specifics early on, such as the fact that some leaders have an ability that's used every couple turns, which can really benefit winning the first round. These leaders don't get as much power in one move, but they may get more power overall in multiple rounds. They're also encouraged to play into more rounds because of that power. However, leader abilities may not be able to beat the inherent advantages in going first, which are an additional 5 points and another redraw. First player is given this advantage because by going first, they take greater risk. Since they are one less card in their hand before their opponent, they can usually not gain two cards out of their opponent unless their opponent truly screws up. This means that whoever goes first either needs to win round one or give up early enough to not risk losing any cards in their hand. Luckily, with the additional resources provided to them by going first, this usually isn't too hard if you can accurately predict whether you'll win or lose round one early enough. This makes it sound like you need to memorize every card in order to play this game effectively. At the level where I'm at, that is true, but for a new player there are more effective ways to learn the game. Instead of memorizing everything, a new player may want to imitate a deck that a pro player is using, or one that's popular at the rank that they're at, that they think that they'll enjoy playing, then practicing with it until they understand all the nuances within that deck. Through this play, a new player should be able to start understanding the natural rhythms that come with playing Gwent. This should also expose them to some new ideas and new decks. 
If they find a deck that looks fun to play, or one that they don't understand, then they should probably take it up and start mastering the nuances of that deck as well. As you start to use the decks more and more, you might be able to take the things that really work within one deck, and put a lesser version of it in another deck, but in a way that will still make that other deck stronger. You might also start noticing situations that come up nearly every game, or cards that seem to be in every popular deck, and then you might be able to find cards that aren't that powerful by themselves, but because you're fighting these decks almost every game, you might want to put them in your deck anyways, just to disrupt the opponent. This is how I managed to memorize every card within Gwent. I thought about the function of every card and how it might improve the deck based on the situations it tends to come across. For example, the card Arrakis Venom is really good at killing Witchers, which a lot of popular, popular decks are using. However, if that changes, then I might want to use a card like Manticore Venom instead, providing that it's worth its cost. In any case, I think that Gwent is one of the few systems that actively rewards people who spend the time to make these discoveries and experiments by implementing their season high based ranking system. By judging a player according to their season high instead of their win-loss ratio, a player can start experimenting with decks even in high ranked play in order to get better for the next season. Since a player's rank is determined by their performance in four out of five factions, it's easy to apply a discovery once it's made. If you're fighting an opponent who is playing, let's say, an elf deck, and they teach you how to play elves better, suddenly you have a way to improve your win-loss ratio with elves that might improve your overall ranking. As an example of this, during this season, I noticed that most of the popular decks were running a boosting card that boosted their units up at least plus eight. So I knew I was going to include a card called a Punisher in most of my decks. Punishers are expensive cards that remove a powerful threat from the board. Most of these cards are a variant of Geralt, however I noticed most of the popular decks at the time would be more punished by a Regis than by Geralt, so that allowed me to put higher Vampire Regis in the deck. This went against popular opinion at the time, and I was even mocked for the inclusion. Nonetheless, my win rate improved significantly with the inclusion of this card in several of my decks. Most of the matches were actually decided and ended spectacularly with this card, like this one versus popular streamer Sir Pumpkin. It'd be a shame if his last card was Ghoul. We still win though. Right? 14, 8, 22, 56. We still win if his last card's Ghoul. No! Not again! Oh, it's all you suck! Pumpkin probably didn't expect a Regis in the monsters deck, because Regis usually doesn't fit the archetypical role of the monsters, and might actually be a hindrance to it if the opponent runs the card Blue Dream. Each faction generally has three archetypical abilities, or concepts, which are tied to that faction, and they also have four leaders. Three of the leaders usually support that archetypical ability, with a fourth having a unique or interesting ability that doesn't really fit. The three archetypes associated with monsters are Thrive, Consume, and Deathwish. Woodland Spirit, the leader that I was using, supports the Thrive archetype. Creatures that thrive are boosted by one power every time a creature stronger than them is played. It's worth noting that monsters also have the strongest individual units, and they also have some units which gain different powers whether you control the strongest unit on the board or not. Pumpkin was probably surprised because units with Thrive are constantly boosted in power, and if he was to take Regis Hire Vampire from my graveyard using Blue Dream, he'd be able to steal all the boosts that I had built up in my units, probably resulting in certain death for me. The last two abilities of the monsters faction, Consume and Death Wish, really play with one another. Consume eats one of your own units and gains strength equal to their strength, whereas Death Wish triggers an ability upon dying, such as killing your opponent's units. Since I'm on the discussion of archetypes anyways, I might as well describe the rest for all of the factions in case there are some concepts that jump out as particularly interesting for new players. Moving on from the monsters, we have the militaristic Empire of Nilfgaard, with its three archetypes, Reveal, Deploy, and Spies. Reveal cards reveal a card from either your deck or your opponent's deck, and give a benefit depending upon what is revealed. Deploy effects trigger from the hand, and are usually dependent upon what's in your hand. Deploy effects activate as soon as the card is used, and many of them have differing effects depending upon what else is in your hand. The last archetype, Spies, puts something on the opponent's side of the field in order to give you some sort of benefit or cause them a problem as long as it's still alive. Debatably, Nilfgaard also has a fourth archetype of giving your opponent some boost of power in order to take advantage of it later, though this technically falls in line with the other archetypes. Moving on from the Empire of Nilfgaard, we go to the fantasy races of Scoia'tael, a coalition of elves, dwarves, dryads, and other fantasy creatures fighting their human oppressors. Scoia'tael's archetypes are movement, hand buffing, and unity. Movement moves units to other rows, often with other benefits depending upon what's on the board. 
Hand buffing improves your units before they hit the board, which can be transferred over into future rounds. It also often triggers additional effects. Unity is a catch-all term for creature types that tend to benefit one another. For example, there are a lot of cards that get stronger depending upon the number of elves that are on the field, or the number of dwarves that are on the field. Now that we're done with the fantasy races, let's move on to the Irish Vikings known as Skellige. The archetypes that define Skellige are Bloodthirst, Discarding, and the ability to revive from the dead. Bloodthirst abilities are simply abilities that get stronger depending upon how many damaged enemies that there are. The important thing to know about discarding is that you can usually only do it to yourself and that there are some cards that really like to be discarded. Coming back from the dead is pretty self-explanatory, however there are some Skellige units that have some pretty bad effects on them that don't happen if they come back from the dead. And now we're on to our final faction, a bunch of squabbling kings finding over what little money and power that they have, known as the Northern Realms. The three archetypes that define the Northern Realms are Orders, Charges, and Boosting. Orders are abilities that take a turn to activate, but can be activated together. The number of times a unit can use these abilities is usually dictated by the number of charges that they have. In general, the Northern Realms has more units that boost other units, and more units that have unique abilities by being boosted. They also tend to use a lot of dragons, if that makes them more appealing for you. If you're trying to analyze the function of your opponent's deck, it's probably important to know how to actually put together a deck. Every deck has 25 or more cards, but every one of the cards within the deck has a point value. Every deck has 150 points to spend, plus however many the leader gives, indicated by its golden number. So if you see an opponent play a lot of very cheap cards with a leader that has a lot of points, you know that their deck is probably running a lot of very expensive cards. Since you can check the points of the cards that have been played in the middle of the match, you may be able to predict what cards are in the opponent's deck based on how many points they have when they go into the final round. By paying attention to point cost, then faction, then strategy, you might be able to figure out which cards are likely to be left in the opponent's deck. When I say strategy, I mean how the deck plans to finish you off in round 3. Most decks fit together in support of one or a couple of very strong cards, often called finishers because they finish the game. A good example of this is the Wild Boar of the Sea, which deals 2 damage to every enemy that is already damaged. Usually, the opponent has no reason not to kill your cards outright. However, if they are just doing a little bit of damage and leaving them upright, they might be a Wild Boar of the Sea deck. However, they could also be a Dragon's Dream deck, which deals 3 damage to everyone on the same row after 3 turns, so they could be lowering your units down to 3 points since they know they're going to die anyways. What winning conditions you can expect from your opponent depends upon what's popular right now and which win conditions people know how to solve. As much as this game is about prediction, there is something to be said about having a deck that is simply stronger. It does no good to use a deck that is not strong enough to beat your opponent even if you completely outpredict them. This leads to the community members coming to a consensus over which deck are the strongest and most competitive, which means that those decks are the most common that you'll see in ladder, which is why I think it's important to mention the community even in this introductory video, because it's important to know what's popular, so that way you can exploit it. This is called playing with the meta, when you are developing your own strategy specifically to counter what is considered strong or popular within the community. As soon as the community decides on the strongest deck, this creates a pattern which can be exploited. However, as these exploits are discovered, the consensus over what the strongest decks are changes, and it becomes harder to break away from the mold and gain an advantage through discovery. Gwent's developers, CDPR, have said that they will make changes to the game to improve it every month, and roughly every three months they'll introduce new cards to the game, since CDPR is constantly changing the game, there should be new discoveries and new advantages to gain through those discoveries no matter when you join. And I'm referring to major discoveries, not minor discoveries like refinements, or figuring out the right order to play things, or what row to play it on. Oh, rows! I didn't even mention rows! Each card can be played on a front row known as the melee row, or a back row known as the ranged row. Some cards have different effects based on which row they're played on, but for the most part you play on different rows to avoid cards that target rows instead of people. And that's it. You ready to start acting like a Gwentleman? Check in the description to discover some of my favorite resources, YouTubers, and streamers for Gwent, such as GwentUp, an online collection of popular decks used within the Gwent community. If you're interested in starting to play Gwent, let me know in the comments below. I'm thinking of making an account to stay in the low ranks in order to see if there's any new developments happening there. I'm planning on making about 5 accounts, and I wouldn't mind using someone else's invitation code to make those accounts. If you want to use my invitation code, it's located in the description below. This is Ogre Knight signing out, and I can't wait to see you on the battlefield.